Hi, I'm John Davidson, lead pastor at Evangel Temple. Thank you so much for tuning into the message today. I hope it's a blessing and an encouragement to you. If it is, leave us a note in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. I hope you enjoy this message from God's Word today. What I want to talk to you about today is being available. So what we'll do is walk through Isaiah chapter 6, verse by verse, and then I'll share a little bit about how my life was transformed because people were simply available. And uh, so Isaiah 6, it's a true story. It really happened. Maybe some background here. The book of Isaiah is not in chronological order. Um, it's important when you read Isaiah to just keep that in the back of your mind because sometimes it seems a bit discombobulated. Maybe it doesn't make sense. We know that because I, Isaiah 6 addresses uh, circumstances with King Uzziah, but in chapter 1, it, there's a prophecy relating to King Ahaz. And actually, King Ahaz comes after King Uzziah. So chronologically, Isaiah 6 takes place before Isaiah 1. Um, but this is what it says. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. So what we're about to read here is a story for a believing believer. This is not a fairy tale. This is not folklore. This actually happened. It says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim. So seraphim are a type of angel. So in Scripture, you have cherubim, nephilim, seraphim, and a few other M's. Seraphim are a type of angel. So I saw seraphim, and each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And so I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, your sin is purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. So the story here, the backdrop is the death of someone named King Uzziah. So who is Uzziah? Well, King Uzziah was the king over ancient Judea, depending upon what commentary, commentary you read and what scholar you follow. Let's just say his reign came to an end as king around the year 739 B.C. So we'll just put a pin there, okay? So it's around there. He was the king of Judea, and actually when he became the leader of his nation, so to speak, Things were not going very well. Things were in decline. And so King Uzziah is known in history as being someone who brought significant reform. One of the things he did is he strengthened the military of his nation. Uh, he was very innovative with weaponry. You can see this both in Scripture and in other historical accounts, that the weapons of his army were fairly sophisticated. And because of that, he was able to protect his nation from foreign invaders. Um, he defeated the Philistines. He defeated the Arabians in battle. He forced the Ammonites to pay tribute. So now not only has he, has he protected his nation from foreign invasion, actually there is cash coming into the bank, if you will, because other nations are now intimidated by him because of the strength of his army. Another thing he did is he harnessed the power of natural resources in his kingdom some of the things he did, he dug water wells all over his nation. Water is uh, uh, powerful, if you will. It doesn't matter how strong your army is. It doesn't matter how much cash you have in the bank. Without food or water, good luck, right? So he dig, wa digs water wells all over his nation, and he cultivates um, the agricultural industry. So the livestock begins to grow and expand, they begin to grow their own fruits and vegetables, and because of that, trade occurs. So you've got this nation who used to be constantly invaded, and their economy struggled, and now they're safe. They can let their kids go out and play without fear of foreign invasion. 
They actually have food on their table. They have water to drink. Maybe in our context, it's hard to understand, but I've been in many parts of the world where food and water are weaponized, where literally people who are oppressive use food and water to control the lives of other people. I remember standing in the middle of sub-Saharan Africa where the average woman spends four hours a day looking for water. Another two hours a day looking for some sort of fuel to boil the water to kill the parasites so that she and her family can have water to drink. And standing in the middle of nowhere, and there was a water well. And posted at the top of the water well was a sign written in multiple languages. One of them was Arabic. And the sign said, and I quote, choose today to convert to, and it had the name of the particular God, and you and your, water, you and your family can draw water from the well. Choose not to convert, and you and your family go thirsty. What they were doing is they were using water to force convert the poor. And I watched as there was a line of women and children standing in line who succumbed to a particular religious belief and creed simply so that they could survive. So in our context, we may not understand what it means to weaponize food and water, but it still takes place all over the world today. And it was taking place in ancient Judea, but King Uzziah changed all of that. So the nation is thriving. Things are going well. Isaiah is a prophet under the leadership of King Uzziah. And the Bible tells us a story where one day King Uzziah goes into the temple to burn incense. Now, it doesn't seem like a big deal to maybe light a candle, you know, or, or cause the, you know, a fragrance to fill the air, but this is something that was reserved for the priesthood. So the king, because he was successful in politics and leadership, something happens in his heart, and he actually becomes a bit casual when it comes to the things of God. It's very relevant for our life today because we can become familiar with the things of God, which is dangerous. Even in the Western church context, we can become very familiar with God. It's interesting to me that in the book of Revelation, when God is speaking to the Apostle John and unpacking things that, frankly, I don't understand, you know, there's a lot of clever ideas out there, but I don't fully understand what's going on in the book of Revelation. But what I do know is Jesus addresses seven different churches. He does not rebuke the world. In the book of Revelation, he does rebuke the church. He encourages the church, but he rebukes the church. It's almost as if whenever that day draws near, he is wanting us, his church, to understand that it's important not to just be familiar with him. We have to know him. We have to be like the wise virgins in Matthew 25 and have enough oil in our lamp to burn. Well, anyway, King Uzziah becomes familiar with the things of God. He wanders into the temple to burn incense, and in that moment, he is struck with leprosy. Now, <clears throat> whenever the Bible talks about leprosy or skin diseases, there are various types, but if you've ever come in contact with someone who is leprous, I have. I remember the first time I ever wandered into a leper colony. Whenever you come in contact with someone who has an extreme form of leprosy, it is appalling to look at them. It's horrific, and typically the um, ends, the tips of parts of their body have been eaten away by the skin disease. You come in contact with someone who has leprosy and they're usually missing the end of their nose, parts of their ears have been eaten away, their fingertips are gone, and their body emits a decrepit odor. And when you come in contact with a modern day leper, that leper will not look you in the eyes. He or she is almost always ashamed because of how they look. And I remember the first time I came in contact with a leper, and my gag reflex, I'm a bit embarrassed to, to say this, but my gag reflex kicked in because of what I saw and what I smelled, and I began to dry heave. And I remember needing to turn aside to get my composure, and out of nowhere, I remembered the story of when Jesus healed the leper. Perhaps you remember the story. What I love about that story is when Jesus healed the leper, he did not walk up to the leper and say, be healed and keep going. But Jesus performs a miracle, and the miracle isn't necessarily the healing. The miracle is how the healing takes place, because Jesus reaches out and touches the untouchable. We remember the story. If you don't, that's okay. It's in the scriptures. 
But Jesus not only heals the leper, he touches the leper. I remembered that story, and so I, within about 30 seconds, I get my act together, and I did what you would do. I just decided to give the lepers hugs. Well, King Uzziah is a leper. And because of Levitical law, for the rest of his life, he will be quarantined to a leper colony. So the most powerful man in the kingdom, the one responsible for the thriving national economy, the one responsible for a fortified nation, will now vacate the throne and live as a recluse alone. Isaiah, who has access to the king, in the year that King Uzziah dies... So Isaiah is in the middle of a, of a moment where he is reminded of how temporary earthly success is. That you can be the most powerful person in a kingdom and in a moment be struck with leprosy. He sees how temporary things are. Like James says, our life is but a, a vapor, it's but a mist. In the year that King Uzziah dies, he sees the Lord. And what does he see? He sees that the Lord is high and lifted up and seated on a throne. Pastors in the middle of a series, of the Gospel of Matthew, talking about the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God behind it has a king seated on a throne. And he administrates his kingdom. He orchestrates things. He is not a puppeteer, but he is sovereign. And he is very much in control of things. He sees the Lord seated on a throne. And the scripture record says the train of his robe fills the temple. Back then, maybe to refresh your memory, here was the custom. Let's say I'm a military general and John is the king of the kingdom. And he would say, hey, Heath, we need you to go over here and fight the Arabians. Well, our army would go fight the Arabians. Let's say we were victorious in battle. What we did is we took the crown from the defeated king or the defeated queen we took their crown and all of the jewels were stripped off of it and when we came back to our kingdom someone sewed the jewels on the train of our king or queen's robe so whenever a king or queen walked through his or her court or walked through the streets of his or her kingdom the longer the train of the robe was it was really a symbol of how victorious or valiant their army was in battle so when isaiah sees the lord seated on a throne and the train of his robe fills the temple it's a present progressive it literally means the train of his robe fills and fills and fills and fills and fills the temple it never stops filling the temple what it's saying is the one who is seated on a throne is always victorious always the train of his robe never stops filling the temple. Sometimes I will, I will remind myself of this truth when my situation does not line up with what I know to be true about God. Someone put it this way, that discouragement knocks on the door of the White House and it knocks on the door of your house. Every now and then, each one of us has an experience that doesn't line up with what we know to be true about God. So in that moment, I will pastor my heart and remind myself, oh, the train of his robe keeps filling and filling and filling and filling the temple. He also catches a glimpse of the angels. He sees the Lord seated on a throne, and it also says the angels are crying out to one another. They're not crying out to God. They're not crying out to the earth. The angels are crying out to one another. And what is the topic of their their discussion they're saying god is holy 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 in ancient hebrew whenever you want to show emphasis on something you double the word so let's say we went out for a steak one of those aged prime u.s angus ribeyes and at the end of the meal the steak was great and the waiter or the waitress comes by and asks well how was your steak keith it was great great that's how you show emphasis in the ancient hebrew or let's say you watch a beautiful sunset boy that sunset was beautiful beautiful all throughout scripture whenever a word is emphasized that word is doubled so like in the annals of the kings whenever it talks about pure gold it will say it was gold gold nowhere in the bible is something tripled except when referring to god's holiness the angels are crying out to one another and they're not saying god is holy holy 
They're saying God is holy, holy, holy. Holiness is not the same thing as being legalistic. Holiness is not the same thing as being conservative. No, God is beautiful. It, it refers to God's, God's superlative inapproachability. He dwells in inapproachable light, and yet we can approach the throne of grace with boldness because we have a high priest who's able to sympathize with us in our time of need. He is holy, holy, holy. It's important that we don't use relevance as an excuse to compromise, to make the gospel relevant. The gospel will never be more relevant than it is. The Bible is clear that the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. We don't use relevance as an excuse to compromise, but we also should never use holiness as an excuse to create a Christian subculture that we hide in. We are to be in but not of the world. The angels are crying out to one another, God is holy, holy, holy. And what is his response? After the, he hears the angels cry out, after he sees the Lord seated on a throne, after the doorposts are shaken, we see that the presence of God, the glory of God, literally rattles and shakes everything that is made by human hands. I'm reminded that everything that can be shaken will be. It's important to remember we can be successful at what does not matter in eternity. So Isaiah has this experience. He sees God. He hears the angels. He feels a literal shaking as the glory of God, the weight of God is shaking everything around him. And his response, he says, woe is me. To remind you, when a prophet says woe, the prophet is pronouncing a curse. He does not say, woe is this nation. He does not say, woe are all of these crazy lunatic people. A prophet, a minister, if you will, says, woe is me. What I love about this is it's a good example because he comes in contact with God and he is not jaded or cynical. He is not self-deprecating. He is humbled. When we come into the presence of God, humility is the only logical decision. He says, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. So as a prophet, he makes his living as a communicator. Whether he communicates to groups, he communicates to individuals, or he whispers into the ear of a national leader, his job, if you will, his craft, what he's good at, is to use his lips, his mouth, to communicate the oracles of God, the very thing that is supposed to give him influence and power and prestige in the presence of a holy God is nothing. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. In an era where other people would have thought, boy, Isaiah, what an amazing communicator. I mean, after all, he's the, he's the, the prophet who eventually gives us the truths about the Messiah. I mean, Isaiah 60 and 61, Isaiah 53. I mean, obviously, Isaiah is a decent enough communicator. Everybody thinks Isaiah is great at what he does. In the presence of God, Isaiah realizes, I am absolutely nothing. He is humbled. He's not being in, insecure. He's being realistic. I'm learning at the age of 46 that when humility is absent, God usually is absent too. You know, the Bible says God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. I've learned in my life back where there have been many times I thought it was, quote, spiritual warfare. I thought the evil one was trying to mess up my life. And really, it was God standing in my way, opposing me because he found pride. He will oppose the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Isaiah is humbled. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And then he says, I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And then something crazy happens. All of a sudden, an angel. Remember, angels are crying out to one another, holy, holy, holy. God is seated on a throne, high and lifted up. 
everything is shaking, he cries out, he says, woe is me, and an angel flies over here to an altar and takes a hot coal, whatever that means, he takes a, a hot coal from the altar and flies to Isaiah and touches his lips, and he's cleansed. What's going on here? God is using a cultural phenomenon to communicate a spiritual truth to Isaiah. God does this all of the time. We see this in Scripture. He does this in our life. So to give you an idea, remember the ancient prophet Jonah. What is he swallowed by? What? A fish, right? Did you know the ancient Ninevites worshipped a fish god? So you've got Jonah who's swallowed by a fish in the belly of a fish for three days. He wanders into ancient Nineveh covered in fish vomit, smelling like rotten tuna noodle casserole all he does is preach the word of god and the entire city repents what i love about that story is that god doesn't just send a prophet to communicate a message he sends a prophet to communicate a message in a language everybody understands now we understand why jonah's not swallowed by a hippopotamus the first three miracles jesus performs in the gospel of john what does he do he turns water into wine He heals somebody, and he performs a miracle with bread. In this region, in Asia Minor, there were three primary gods, Demeter, Dionysius, and Asclepius. What were were these deities responsible for? One of them was the deity of bread. One of them is the deity of healing. One of them is the deity who supposedly turned water into wine. So there's a reason why the first three miracles Jesus performs in this region are directly related to the three false gods they worshipped. It's almost as if he's saying it takes three gods to do what I can do without even thinking. He does this all throughout Scripture, and he does this in your life. Like when you become a parent for the first time, or a grandparent for the first time, and you hold the little one in your arms, and your heart explodes with love that you had no idea was there. And God shows you the love of a father, the love of a mother, and in that moment, you can realize this is how the father loves me he communicates to us in a language we understand this is what he's doing to isaiah because here was the custom back then when someone was accused of a crime what they did is they drug you in front of a magistrate or a tribunal or a judge it just depends on what country and what culture and in order to find out whether or not you were guilty or not guilty what they did they took a coal from an altar that was heated the coals were heated to 900 degrees fahrenheit They took some tongs, took a coal from the altar, and walked up to you and touched your lips with the hot coal. And if your lips blistered, the gods found you guilty. If your lips didn't blister, you were not guilty. How many of you know there was a 100% guilty rate? (laughs) Right? What's going on with Isaiah? He is guilty. He says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And God, using a cultural Custom that he would have been familiar with, he sends an angel to touch his lips and he's clean. The coal doesn't make him clean, it's a symbol. And you got to notice the order here because Isaiah confesses his sin and then he's cleansed. This is, a, this is what the gospel looks like confession is made unto salvation. We are not cleansed before we confess. We must confess, we must humble ourselves and confess, and then we can be cleansed. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you. So Isaiah is in the middle of this sensation, and he hears God having a conversation. You can read about it, verse 7 and 8. God is having a conversation asking who can I send and Isaiah says here I am send me so Isaiah's response to catching a fresh glimpse of God he is a prophet he has known God but now all of a sudden God reintroduces Isaiah to himself his response is to be available for just a few more minutes that's what i want to talk to you about i want to talk to you about the power of simply being available to god 
Because what God uses in Isaiah's life is not his education. It's not necessarily his training. I'm not against that. It's valuable. I've taken some classes too. But he does not use his education or his training alone. He does not use his brilliance. He does not use all of his money. He primarily uses his availability. And everything else follows. He says, here I am. You can send me. Isaiah volunteers to do something he was already doing. What if the church volunteered again to be the church? What if we volunteered and we said, God, I'm willing to do it again? My life was transformed because people were available. So as far as we know, I'm the first Christian in my ancestry. When I was a young boy, I was introduced to the spiritual world by those closest to me. I had a lot of experiences. I was introduced to witchcraft, the occult, Satanism, and other things. And I saw a lot of things. A lot of experiences. Things so sensationalized, I've never talked about publicly. I knew as a young boy, age five, six, and seven, that what you don't see is more real than what you do see. And so I became very hungry and curious, and I started to research. As a young boy, I started to read philosophy. I started to study various religions and spiritualities. Yeah, I played video games, I skateboarded, I played basketball, but I was also consumed with trying to find language to describe the truths or the reality I experienced. And so I explored multiple religions. But I never really heard the gospel until eighth grade. In eighth grade, a young girl named Allie invited me to church. We were friends in junior high. We were boyfriend and girlfriend. What that meant is we talked at school. <laughs> and uh, she took me to youth group a few times. And I remember I was very curious. At that time, I had taken a break from drug abuse. I started abusing drugs in sixth grade. But I took a break from abusing drugs because my mom and my stepdad got married. And he was Sicilian, so I had to go to catechism classes. So I went to youth group a few times with my friend, uh, Ali in eighth grade, and also went to some catechism classes. I remember reading some books, praying the rosary, but God did not transform my heart. I never yielded to him. It wasn't God's fault. It was mine. I never yielded to him. So when I went to high school, I just went off the deep end and became very involved in the occult and things, and I was a very angry person, very violent person. I was a dangerous person to be around, and I was lost, about as dark as you can get, and I was a drug addict, just had a lot of issues. And I remember one day, my physics partner, <clears throat> we had physics after lunch, my junior year in high school. And um, he invited me to church. And I remember I was typically under the influence of substances in physics class because it was a class after lunch. I remember one day we were dropping balls down ramps calculating velocity, which is a skill I've never used since, but if you want to be an astronaut at NASA, you need to know that. But we were calculating velocity, and I was tripping on LSD and hallucinating, and my lab partner said, what is wrong with you? And we started talking about our lives, and he was a Christian. And so we started talking about religion over the months, and I remember asking him one day, I said, hey, I saw on the cover of the National Enquirer at the grocery store that Jesus was coming back. Is that true? He said, it is true. I said, well, when is he coming back? He said, I don't know when he's coming back. What matters is not when he comes back. What matters is are you ready when he does? I had no idea what he was talking about. But the Bible talks about the arrows of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit had been working on me. So for about four months, I remember whenever I would abuse substances, whenever I was doing things I shouldn't do, I look back now and I realize the Spirit of God was convicting me. I remember getting out of the car thinking, I just can't do this anymore. And I would walk home in the middle of cold Iowa winters because something was going on in my heart and I didn't know. I felt like I was being drawn to God, but I didn't know who Jesus was. I remember he invited me to church one day and I went, Super Bowl Sunday night, 1995. It was a little Assemblies of God church. I walked in, people had their hands raised. I remember a pastor opening up a Bible. He preached, big vein popped out of the middle of his forehead, and I remember thinking, this guy really believes what he's talking about. 
remember somebody spoke in tongues. That didn't really bother me because there are demonic tongues. I think sometimes we're afraid that when we talk about the reality of the supernatural, we're going to freak people out. But the supernatural is much more prevalent than you realize. You really don't find unbelieving witch doctors. You find a lot of unbelieving believers, though. So when someone spoke in tongues, it didn't bother me. But I remember leaving thinking, these people are nuts. I'm not going back. So fast forward, on a Sunday, me and three other friends, we went to a park. We're abusing substances. One of the drugs we were abusing is methamphetamines. And when you get high on that, you can't sleep at night. I remember my friend brought a Bible. And he opened up his Bible and read the story out of Mark chapter 5 about a guy named Legion. And I remember he asked, after he read the passage, he asked, who do you guys think Jesus is? One of my friends said, passionately, with conviction, Jesus is a reincarnated Native American Indian warrior. And he began to explain why that was true. And I remember thinking, I have no idea who Jesus is. The other friend of mine was a backslidden Pentecostal. He knew the gospel front and back. But just because you know it doesn't mean you know it. He wasn't born again. He was familiar. But he spoke the truth of who Jesus was. And I remember thinking what impressed me about the story is here's this man who is a self-mutilator who had a lot of issues. He runs to Jesus, and Jesus was not repulsed or embarrassed. Instead, Jesus very practically asked, hey, what's your name? I remember thinking Jesus was not repulsed by the man with issues. Went home that night, and I remember talking to God. And I can't describe it. It's almost like the sky cracked open and love began to rain down in my bedroom. And I I remember staying awake all night because I couldn't sleep because of what was in my blood, talking to Jesus. I did that the second night. The third night, I said to my physics partner, I'm coming to church with you on Wednesday. I think I need to raise my hand and do that thing the preacher asked people to do that Sunday night I was there. I walked into the most dysfunctional church service you can fathom. God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, doesn't he? I walked into a small youth room. There were about 20 to 25 teenagers sitting in a circle. People were yelling at one another. People were using swear words. The police were there. One of the officers, Officer Willie, I knew very well. What I found out is somebody made death threats against the pastor. And so the pastor and the board had to excommunicate a family from the church. So they're having a a youth group meeting explaining why two of the teenagers in their youth group can never come back. And so I'm sitting there. I walk in. I haven't slept for four nights because of the substances in my body, wearing my Grateful Dead t-shirt with a big marijuana leaf right here. (laughs) I'm sitting there. People are screaming, yelling at one another. The cops are there, and it felt like Thanksgiving dinner to me. (laughs) And I'm, I'm sitting there, and my physics partner's dad was a volunteer. He was a truck driver, but he volunteered in the youth group. And he said, Dad, Heath is coming to church. I know tonight's going to be crazy. No matter what, you have to give an altar call. So I sit there, endure the whole thing. Everybody bow your heads, close your eyes. John 3, 16, if you want Jesus to change your life, raise your hand. So I raise my hand. I walk forward 20 feet because that's how big the youth room was. And God changed my life set free from every single addiction like that I remember going home that night I found an old Bible a King James Bible read through the New Testament I didn't understand any of it but in here I knew this this means something the day after I met Jesus I walked into my high school and people said Heath what's different about you one after another what's different about you I went home that day on a Thursday and checked the mail I had a letter in the mailbox from that girl in eighth grade who invited me to youth group. The Lord reminded her of all the questions I used to ask her about God. Five-page letter, handwritten. A few weeks before, the Lord just impressed upon her heart to write down answers to all the questions I used to ask her about God. She just happened to mail it one day walking through the mall. just happened to arrive in my mailbox the day after I met Jesus. I ended up marrying that girl. And I remember after we got married, I found her prayer journals reading in her prayer journals. God, I pray you reveal yourself to Heath. My life was transformed because a teenager in physics class was available. 
He just simply invited me. He didn't assume that I would say no. Don't underestimate the power of an invitation. And I'm not just talking about inviting someone to church. I mean, that's always a good idea. But inviting somebody into your home for a meal. You know, something like a home-cooked meal is a new idea. You know, there are people who are new parents who, who don't have a clue how to raise their kids. Sometimes signs, wonders, and miracles have nothing to do with angels showing up and tucking us in bed at night. Maybe a sign and a wonder and a miracle is inviting somebody into your home and actually having a conversation without your cell phone in your hand. What does it look like to be available? Have coffee with someone? Invite somebody? What does it look like to be available? That, that volunteer in the youth group? I used to show up at his house. I would read the Bible. I had, he was actually a minister in between churches, and I had so many questions about the Bible. I remember reading in the book of Genesis how it was a serpent, and in the book of Revelation, it was a dragon. And as a young, innocent Christian, I asked myself, who fed the snake? I remember reading the book of Job, and I thought it was a book about jobs. I didn't know anything about the Bible, and I needed somebody to help me. And here's this volunteer truck driver. After driving all night, he would sit at his table and eat his cornflakes. Dozens of questions. I'd show up at his house with a legal pad I stole from the church, <laughs> asking him questions. Why does Matthew say this, but John says that? He took time. He was available. That young eighth-grade girl unbeknownst to me at the time walking through the hallway since the lord say pray for him my life was transformed because somebody was available to invite me somebody was available to take time somebody was available to pray what does it look like to be available maybe just as you're going through the grocery store slowing down and daring to believe god when he whispers and buying the groceries for the person in front of you I guess what strikes me about the story in Isaiah 6 is he has this supernatural experience and his response is, here I am. I'm available. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the simplicity of your word. Thank you that your word is always practical enough to live out and walk out. And I want to ask two questions with every eye closed. If you're in here or you're watching or listening online, I want to ask two questions. First question is this, do you know Jesus? The same Jesus that transformed my life when I was 17 is the same Jesus who knows everything about you and he's not repulsed by you. He loves you, but that doesn't mean he condones everything you're doing. If you don't know Jesus, Jesus wants you to meet him. Jesus made it clear. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one, no one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is not the most relevant way. He's not the easy way. He is the only way. I'm not asking if you've been baptized. I'm not asking if you go to church. I'm asking if you know him. And if today you need to make things right with Jesus, I'm going to ask you to be bold and courageous and just simply slip your hand up. And if, if you slip your hand up, you're saying, that's me. I need to make things right with God. Up, 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 up. I want to ask you a second question, and the question would be this. Are you willing to just be available? Like Isaiah, he had known God for years, and he just had to sign up again and say, God, I always want to be available. And if that's you, and before the Lord, you would just simply say, God, I want to be available. I don't want my relationship with you to just be casual or familiar. For the rest of my life, I just want to be available. And if that's you, just slip your hand up really quick. Up, up, up. I want to be available. You can put them down. You can put them down. <clears throat> what I want to encourage you is this, as your pastor comes. Being available is not complicated. Being available is being childlike. Simply being willing to say yes, not after God speaks. Say yes before God speaks. If you're available, God will work through you. God bless you. Thanks again for watching the service today. I hope it was an encouragement to you. We'd love to hear from you. So if you'd like to leave a note in the comments and let us know what you thought about the message, we'd love that. And if you're ever in the Springfield, Missouri area on a Sunday morning, we'd love to have you join us for church. You can attend our 8 a.m. classic service or you can join us for church at 9.30 or 11.